Honorary Member, so make us all send it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will be brief, but I do think that this is an important piece of legislation, not simply in terms of what it allows the government of Barbados to be able to do with respect to being able to have a sovereign culture guarantee in its arsenal as one of the instruments that we're able to enter into with the with multilateral agencies such as the Inter-American Development Bank. This bill it becomes necessary because the current legislation governing our operations with institutions like the IDB, um, specifically the IDB Act, does not make provision for the kind of relationship and the kind of instrument, uh, the kind of guarantee that can enhance the credit worthiness um, or the confidence of a particular operation, such as the one described by the member who led this bill. And so this becomes necessary to enable the government of Barbados to do what it needs to do. And in that regard, I support the bill. But I do want to give brief reflection. Uh, in line, Mr. Speaker, with some of the observations and the reflections already made by the member for Christchurch East Central, who finds himself having to make these kinds of appeals and explanations to you, to the people of Barbados, but not just to the, to, to the, to the public, but importantly to some of our colleagues who would seek to hold forth on some of these issues for their own leverage or gain, and therefore would seek to obscure what is the plain truth of the financial situation or the economic position of Barbados. And I would dare say that the member found himself, finds himself, the government finds itself in that position of constantly having to explain, uh, constantly having to repeat some of these principles for one simple fact in our history, in our very recent history, and that is the fact that we are still suffering from the ignominy, the unwelcome distinction of having had a finance minister whose performance and whose record of economic management can in no wise be celebrated, who led an economic response to the 2008 financial crisis, sir, that saw him repeatedly and publicly throwing up his hands in despair, who saw him publicly declaring, well, this is the worst crisis that the world has ever faced and could possibly face. I beg of thee, what would you have me do? That was the refrain of the former Minister of Finance. That is the reason that we find ourselves in this position. That is the reason that the member for Christchurch East Central will constantly, and successive governments, I dare say, will constantly have to remind Barbadians that they can trust the economic decision-making of the government that they chose. We are suffering that track record, regrettably. Except, sir, it was not the worst economic and human development crisis that the world could possibly face. And having the benefit of reflection might make one say that this, that we are now experiencing, is perhaps the worst economic and human development and climate and debt and financial crisis that we could possibly face. And accept, sir, that unlike what that minister at the time suggested, it was possible, it was possible to face down and to fix the country's ballooning debt crisis, because we did. And we demonstrated that it could be done. But we continue to suffer the international public shame and disgrace, and we have it on our track record, regrettably, even though the world is beginning to forget because of the actions of this administration. 
But we are having to have these conversations because of the trust that was lost during that period. And in many ways, we have a responsibility to keep talking and keep explaining because the government is the government. And we have to make up regrettably for the fact that we did have a finance minister whose answer to a $17 billion debt problem was a $17 million debt reprofiling plan. Imagine you have a debt of $17.6 billion. And the best that the then minister could think up was to reprofile the debt to the tune of $70 million. That was the grand plan. That was as far, sir, as he could rise to the occasion. Now, I do not say these things to shame a man for having failed to rise to the occasion. I, I, don't, I have not had much experience with that affliction. But even had I, it would not be in my nature to point out such deficiencies for the primary purpose of shaming a person. That's not who I am, sir. And I do not say these things to dwell in the past. I do not say these things to dwell in the past. I am sensitive and convinced of the truth that the government is the government. You are elected to serve. You are elected to lead. And that is why I never want to hear from these front benches, like we heard from the last finance minister, what would you have me do? I, I, I am saying it to my, my, my colleagues in arms. I never want to hear that kind of approach because the government is the government. I never want to hear explanations and excuses about finance payments not being made on time because the government is the government. I never want to hear observations about what might be deficiencies in the human capacity of project teams in a ministry. And, I, and I'm warning us, but in all seriousness, not to start, because before I had the singular distinction of being asked by the people of St. Michael South Central to, to sit in this honorable place, that was an annoyance as a citizen of this country that I had of the last administration. And I'm saying it, all cards on the table. A government must never throw up its hands and not have a plan. If you are coming to this place to make observations about what is wrong in the government, who are you telling? Who are you telling? But I do say these things, sir, to make the point that that period where the then finance minister and the then government could not find a plan beyond a $70 million debt reprofiling, that that was not rock bottom for the global and economic system. This arguably is a far more complete crisis. But you know, so when you cried wolf at that time to make up for the fact that you were the one eating the livestock, that you were the one feasting on the self-declared fatted calf, when you cried wolf to cover up for that fact, when the wolf really comes and a new farmer calls it, then the inhabitants of the village have less trust for the word of the farmer. And regrettably, that's what we're living in. We have, and I say we because we are the leadership of this country, to be able to, 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 to plug in and do the work to be able to explain things to people of, of, of this country. But even in the face of the real wolf, sir, this government has not said, what would you have me do? In the face of the real wolf, this government has developed new financial instruments, such as this one, to be able to return the volley time and time again. And this is not the only weapon in our arsenal. We were able to introduce natural disaster clauses so that in the event of a disaster, we have two years moratorium and we don't have to repay. We were able to, on the basis of those natural disaster clauses, convince the Inter-American Development Bank 
to develop something called the principal payment option that mirrors the natural disaster clauses in their own debt. We were able, as the former speaker said, to establish a resilience and sustainability trust. But I want to go a little bit further if this chamber will indulge me. And I will try to go quickly because I know that we have some weather on the horizon. I want to make reference, sir, to the fact that in 2018, the debt service in this country was 68%. 68 cents out of every dollar went to pay down the debt. In January of this year, the debt service was 30%. 30 cents out of every dollar went to pay down the debt. What does that mean? It means that where in 2018, when we came to service as a government, all the room that we had was 32% to spend 32 cents out of every dollar to spend on education, on health, on roads, on all these things. After the debt restructuring, after we did the work that we needed to do, that number increased to 70 cents out of every dollar. It makes a difference. And that's the difference. But I want to be able to go further. And I, I, I have to, and sir, if you will please indulge me, to mention two names of the young men, one younger than the other, who pulled some of this data for us, Dr. Kevin Greenwich and Justin Carter, um, together at the Central Bank, who did very important work to be able to help us do two things. To be able to look at what was the loss in GDP to several countries as a result of COVID, and then to look at what they borrowed in response to that loss in GDP. And I can make the document available to, to, to members. I will have to ask one of my colleagues on the front bench mm -hmm. if they're so inclined to move or to, to ask that it be made a document of this house once and for all, because I believe it is important information. And I will go very quickly. In advanced economies, such as Canada. I remember if you're reading from it, if you're you don't have to ask you've got someone from the front bench to so do your if you are if you are endeavoring to quote from it, then it should be it ought to be your responsibility as you want to read from it to lay it before this honorable chamber. I you thank you for the guidance, sir. It. And I will so do. In advanced economies, I begin with Canada that saw a contraction in their economy of 5.4%. Between, between 2019 and 2020, that's the reference period, borrowed 31% of GDP. For reference, I will tell you that the increase in debt in Barbados between 2019 and 2020 was 22%. That was the increase in debt that we saw as a result of COVID. 22%, 22% of GDP. And again, as a member before me said, taking account of the fact that the GDP contracted and it was smaller, Canada shrunk 5.4% and borrowed 31. Barbados shrunk 17.6% and borrowed 22. France shrunk 8.2% and borrowed 15%. Italy shrunk half of Barbados, 8.9%, and borrowed 21%. Shrunk half as much as Barbados and borrowed the same amount in advanced economies. So not in small island states, so not in emerging economies, so not in vulnerable countries. And I could go on and on. The comparison is here, and I encourage members and others to understand on the basis of this document, on the basis of this analysis, that you cannot expect to go through the perfect storm of economic and human development crisis, because this is not the housing crisis of 2007, 2008, that the former finance minister sat down and eat up his fine clothes about and didn't know what to do. This is a thorough and complete meltdown 
in the global economic system. That continues today. That worsens today. Sir, in a couple of weeks, I will have the distinction of sitting on a panel with colleagues who are governors of central banks and chief economists of institutions, as I know I am. To sit down and try and figure out what do we do about global inflation. To sit down and try and figure out what do we do about the impact that the war that Russia started in Ukraine is going to have on famine and drought and existential issues globally. These are the conversations the world is having. And the former finance minister could not figure out how to find his way out of a contraction caused by a crisis in the housing market in 2007, 2008. All up in 2017, can't figure it out. And we want to know why it is that Barbados had to borrow. And I want to, to, to further say that all of this, this conjecture, oh, is the IMF now a development finance institution? <laughs> is it that we are saying that we are partnering with the IMF to be able to access funding? Yes. For those who are being quoted in the newspapers, who cannot hear me, I will repeat myself, yes. Why is that even a question? We need to move away from these fanciful matters that are going to give us a headline and get to the meat of the matter, which is not the fact that we've been able to secure the country at the macro level. The macro level is that you, you build a hospital, you build the building, the building is finished, you plastered, it is going to stand up. That's the work that the economic team has done. That's the beginning. That's the framework. As long as Minister likes to say, that's the backdrop. You now have to go check room by room in those hospital rooms and in those hospital beds, in those households and in those companies, in those small businesses to make sure that those patients are alive and well and thriving and can be discharged. That's the next step that we need to talk about. So I made an attempt in here today, sir, to, 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 to draw some parallels with the reasons for the borrowing, but also to make the point that the gross debt as a percentage of GDP, the highest level it reached post-COVID in Barbados, is already on its way back down. And according to the advice that I received, it's poised to be at around 127% debt to GDP by the end of May, which is around the number it was after the restructuring was finished back on the downward trajectory. So I don't want us to get caught up with wringing our arms about the levels of debt. Because we had to borrow, we were able to borrow to do the work, and the debt numbers are on their way back down. But I want to make a very quick point about the reason for debt. And it is, it is a simple one. Public Finance 101 tells us that you do not take from your piggy bank. You do not take from the consolidated fund. You don't take from the money that you raise on a day-to-day -day basis to pay for day-to-day -day things. You don't take that money and pay for long-term investments. You do not go and pick up all the money, sir, all the money that you have on a credit union to go and make some kind of big investment in a car or in a house. You go to the bank. Some of the wealthiest people, some of the most liquid people in the world will still approach the bank for a mortgage to pay for a home. You don't take your liquidity, you don't take your liquidity and use it to finance long-term Project. You use financing for that purpose. The healthiest of economies use financing for road infrastructure. Use financing for housing infrastructure. Because then you have a return of that investment over time that matches the maturity of the loan that you have taken. And that is the way economies operate. That is why Canada contracted 5.4% and borrowed 31%. But I also 
want to say further that we have something else that is different from when the last government was borrowing, which is that we finally have a foreign reserve position. Just over $3 billion, the level of foreign reserves, and, and, and I don't use call these numbers to show off, but why does it matter? The purpose of foreign reserves is to back your liabilities. Put in other terms, you can have and maintain a certain level of debt if you got reserves. When the last finance minister had 17, 18 billion dollars in debt and four and a half weeks of reserves, well, that was why the country was in the problem it was in. When Barbados now has 135% debt to GDP and three billion in reserves, that is a much better place to be. Global finance institutions look at something called debt-based debt measures of reserve adequacy. All that is a fancy way of saying that if you've got a certain level of debt, you have to have a certain level of reserves. And these are the kinds of things that matter for your level of debt. But I have to say, finally, something that moves us from the macro. That we built, and perhaps the hosp a hospital, new hospital is not the analogy I should use, but let's go with it. We've built the new hospital. We have patients in beds, we have patients in rooms, we have different level of, levels of illness. We are going to need the growth to see the real recovery of those households that are those patients in the rooms and of those businesses. And the conversation now has to move from the macro to the micro. The Minister of Finance, the Honourable Prime Minister, was kind enough to share with us. And I say with us, with me, because as a member of this parliamentary party, a list of projects that the government is looking to execute. The proof is in the pudding, and that is a simple matter. The question of whether we can grow enough to outstrip the interest rates that we have is in the pudding, is in the execution. And it means that there's some entrenched approaches to governance that have to be imploded. I use the word imploded on purpose. Because we cannot have the mandate that we have given to us by the people of Barbados who are, expect, who are the patients in the rooms who are looking to get discharged and not understand that it cannot be business as usual. Even saying it cannot be business as usual is business as usual. And so the things that bedevil the, that execution, the reasons that we cannot get things going, I, I want to see more than a list of projects, I've got to tell you. I want us to be able to understand that we're only going to start to see the growth rate outstrip I, the average interest rate of the portfolio of the new borrowing since 2018 was below 2%. So those who, and we are all colleagues with, the, with, with, with our friends at the university, but let us not demonstrate a propensity to be willfully obtuse. To ask, well, what is the interest rate that you're getting at the IMF that makes it worth it? Well, anybody can tell you that. The member for Christchurch Essential can tell you that. That the IMF money is the cheapest money in town. And to the extent that we have a financing gap, that the government has a financing gap, I need to learn to stop saying we. To the extent that the government has a financing gap, that is one of the better options available. Now, the growth 
that this government has promised us is going to get us beyond that point. But let us not pretend that we don't understand why we are developing a new relationship with the International Monetary Fund. We understand why. Because interest rates are on the way back up globally. Let us lock it in while we can and do the business of the people of Barbados, but let us stop quibbling over this notion of debt and let us start monitoring the real indicators of people's well-being and development. How many people are working? How many people are eating nutritious food? Enough of it. These are the kinds of things. How many people are able to start small businesses that survive a three-year period and then a five-year period? So I hope that with the intervention of the member who led the bill, and I hope that, that, that with my own intervention, I have been able to, to give a little bit of my own understanding of what these questions of debt mean, because I beg of us, let us get beyond the armchair navel gazing and do the work of the people of this country. Because this is time sensitive business. There is a time period. There is a period. My English teacher would not wrap my knuckles for saying time period. But there is a period beyond which people can no longer survive. And that's why we cannot be in the business of kicking the can down the road. What do we need to do to get the projects delivered? If it is the commitment for results program that is going to hold officers and all of us accountable for delivery, let us get it moving. If it is a new approach to understanding performance, let us get it done. There's more that can be said, but I am conscious that we have to get on, not just with making sure that we are secure from the weather, but we also have to get on with the business of making sure that all Barbadians are economically secure. The notion of poverty being a line is a fallacy. Because I can, be, I can be not poor today and I can be poor tomorrow because I have a family member whose surgery I had to pay for or somebody whose university I had to pay for or whose school I had to pay for. Let us understand that we are here to guarantee economic security for the people who elected us to serve and let us get on with the business of doing just that. Mr. Speaker, I'm obliged to you.